Welcome everyone, and welcome to those watching this talk on Google's YouTube channel. My name is Chris DeFay, and I'm a member of the Talks at Google team here in Google's Los Angeles office. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Martin Lubicki, Senior Management Scientist from the RAND Corporation. Dr. Lubicki's research focuses on the impacts of information technology on domestic and national security, a topic he has published extensively on over the years. Uh, the title of today's talk is Crisis and Escalation in Cyberspace. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lubecki. Thank you. Ah, and thank you for inviting me. Well, I guess that's the title of the talk. Actually, what this is is the title of a monograph that Rand should be producing in the next month or two. If you want to really think of the title of the talk, it's going to be closer to something like Why Cyber War Really Isn't War. And I kind of want to start with basic history. Pretty much as soon as people learned to walk on two legs rather than four, people learned to make war on each other. And you had the origin of armies. We had sort of mastered the ground medium. And when people learned to get onto little dugout canoes and even better put up sails and rows and oars and galleys, people had mastered the naval medium. And thus we had naval warfare. It wasn't until 1903 when the Wright brothers could master heavier than air flight that we had mastered the air domain, and thus we had air forces. And of course, until we put things in orbit, we couldn't even start thinking about space warfare. Well, there are a lot of people where I work, particularly across the street from where I work, which happens to be the Pentagon, which are thinking about cyberspace as a new domain of warfare. Here, I suppose my voice should get really deep. But it's something very curious about cyberspace. Yes, you couldn't have cyber war until you actually had a cyberspace. But the reason we have cyber war is because we haven't mastered the medium. And what do I mean by that? Generally speaking, if you've got a computer, it's supposed to do what you think the computer is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to be under your control, not under the control of some random guy 10,000 miles away in a cave somewhere. But that doesn't always work out that way. It turns out that sometimes our systems under the controls of people who don't really mean to do us very, any good. And for the most part, we can go into exceptions you know, in questions. For the most part, people have that kind of control over your machine because of errors in the construction of software or errors in the construction of the relationship between hardware and software. In other words, the reason we have cyber war is not because we've mastered the medium of cyberspace. It's because we haven't mastered the medium of cyberspace. And within these mistakes is you have the potential for all sorts of nasty things to take place. Okay? This is particularly true if you talk about cyber war in terms of malware. And most of what people are talking about, if it's talking about the so-called adva um, advanced persistent threat, if you're talking about things such as Stuxnet, if you're talking about the attack on Aramco and Raskas that Secretary of Defense Panetta mentioned last month, it's in terms of malware. In other words, code that is inserted into your computer that allows the bad guy to make your computer do certain things, presumably that you don't want done. Now, not all of security issues are malware. If you had a world in which you had no malware, you would still have security issues. But as I say in a more, I guess, military context, if you could get rid of malware, you could turn cyber war into a th from a four-star issue into about a one- or two-star issue. In other words, it would become the province of security professionals who could tell you all sorts of interesting ways that people could do things to your computer, but you wouldn't read about it so much in the LA Times or the Washington Post or whatever. And that, in many respects, is a definition of cyber war. Let me just make a little statement about the relationship bet uh, between three things. One is when you have a system or a software, it's what the design manual says it's going to do, right? That's how, th that's how the people who built it think it's going to behave. And then the next part is what you think the computer is going to do. But there's the third part, and that's what the com code says the computer is going to do. And I'm sure you guys know this better than I'm going to ever know this. If there's ever an argument between the design spec and the code, the code is always correct. It is always a better predictor of what the machine is going to do than the design spec. Now, as computer professionals, I'm sure you folks try to make the code 
resemble the design spec as well as you can. But as computer professionals, you also know that systems are extremely complex. And they're getting more complex with every given day. And that means that the task of making the code look like the spec is a very, very difficult one. And it shows no systematic signs of getting any easier. And if the crack between those two is only, to be speaking metaphorically, a bit stream wide, that leaves enough room for the hacker, the bad guy, so to speak, to get into the system. But I want to mention something else, and that is architecture. We have, ha we have an architecture for PCs, which is now about 35 years old, from the ancient CPM machines, from the ancient Apple machines. I got my first personal computer in 1983. In those days, you approached personal computers with a screwdriver, literally. I actually had to assemble my computer from, from parts, because it turns out because of IBM's strange pricing, it was a lot cheaper that way. But the point I want to make is that the PC, the computer in general, was meant to be almost infinitely manipulable by the user. That, in fact, the original owners of PCs back in the late 70s and early 80s were hobbyists. They said, oh, this is interesting. Let's see what it will do. Just like they were sort of the descendants of the folks that had race cars in the 1950s and 60s. And that's all good. And that was lots of fun. But when you have a system that is open to that kind of manipulation and you connect it to a network, then all of a sudden you have effects that are much more serious than I can make a mistake with my computer. OK? Well, the architectural feature of the PC that allows it to be subject to malware is essentially the notion that you can add programs to it. And you can add, if this is a Microsoft machine, you can add programs to the register. And the computer will actually run the programs that are in the register in that order, or in some sort of order, when you boot up the machine. Now, it's also possible to envision, by the way, a computer that cannot have malware in it. And that is to say, by putting, for 90% of all computer users, and I don't think any of you folks are in the 90%, it's sufficient if I give you a PC or an Apple equivalent that's got office automation tools and a web browser, and I can put it all in hardware and give it to you, and I say, here's three years worth of computer. Now, when you're done at the end of three years, of course, it will be three years out of date. Now, you're actually talking to somebody who still has Windows Office 97 running on his computer upstairs, and that's about a 15-year-old program. It probably has a few bugs in it. But all I'm suggesting is that the computer does not have the architecture to accept new good programs. It also will not have the architecture to accept new bad programs. I am not advocating this as a way to build computers. I am saying the ability of the trade-off is still there. OK, so that's the basic factors that you, pro you folks probably know better than I do. Now let's take a look at what happens when something bad happens to your computer. Well, as it turns out in Washington, DC, we're like the seven blind men with the elephant. And everybody takes a look at the problem of computer insecurity from their own lens. If you work for DOD, it's a cyber war problem. If you work for the FBI, it's a cyber crime problem. If you work for the intelligence community, it's a sort of, it's an OPSEC problem, operational security problem. But of course, if you work for the other end of the intelligence community, it's an OPSEC opportunity. Um, that's kind of like what intelligence does. And now I'm going to pick on my good friends at DHS. Because if you work at DHS, it's a cyber terrorism problem. Now, it's also a perimeter control problem. And that leads to some very interesting implications for how DHS spends its money. Now, take a look at DHS. This is, a, this is not a Washington crowd, so I don't expect you to actually know the answer. What are the four largest components of DHS? One of them is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Closely related is Border and Customs border, BC, border something Patrol, right? What are their main functions? To guard the perimeter of the United States against things that we don't want in the United States. Then the number three is the Coast Guard. Well, it has the word guard in it. What is the function of the Coast Guard? apart from pulling, pulling drunken fishermen out of the, the water. And that's to guard the coastline of the United States. They're the last line, so to speak, of maritime defense. And then finally, you have the Transportation Security Agency. Okay? Now, 90% of what they do is to guard a perimeter, the perimeter between you and the, um, the, the gates, so to speak, the airline gates. 
given that it's in their history, given that it's in the construction, is it any wonder that DHS thinks of cybersecurity as a perimeter control problem, rather than as, say, an engine? By the way, if you guys are watch, waiting for the slide to change, it doesn't change until about 30 minutes in. OK? <laughs> I want to relieve some tension you may have. OK? <laughs> <laughs> These guys were wondering, once again, I got to go to the next slide. <laughs> um, DHS has a cybersecurity budget of about a half a billion dollars. Roughly three quarters of that money is spent constructing a giant firewall around the civilian government, or what I can call for short the .gov domain, which interestingly leads to an irony. They spend three quarters of their budget protecting the 2% of their country that's in the .gov domain, leaving one quarter of their budget to protect the 98% of the country that's outside the .gov domain. And sometimes you want to remind these guys at DHS that they kind of actually work for the taxpayers, but nah, that, that may not be where we want to go. OK, let me talk a little bit about terrorism here also. Because it also gives, uh, if you've fallen into the debates in Washington, you know that a lot of people are enthusiastic about the notion of information sharing. We're going to do information sharing, and we're going to put a big dent into our cybersecurity problem. Okay? How many of you have played the game of Clue? Right? What's the game of Clue about? You know, Mr. Green with a pipe wrench in the ballroom. Right? In a terrorism, if I've got information, advanced information, I want to know who's coming at me. I want to know where they're planning to attack, and I want to know how they're planning to attack. But frankly, I don't care that much about how, because except for extraordinary events such as 9-11, it's going to be a gun, a pipe, you know, a car bomb, or something, you know, something like that, right? So let's take this same model and talk about information sharing and cybersecurity. And so you have the same priorities. You want to know who's attacking, you want to know where they're going to attack, and you want to know how they're going to attack. And then you think about this for a minute and said, well, you know, I don't really need to know who's attacking because that's not going to change anything. And it'd be nice to know who they're going to attack. But in fact, they could change their minds almost instantly. What I do want to know is how they're going to attack. Specifically, what software vulnerabilities are they going to take advantage of? Because that's how they get in. That's the interesting stuff, right? Remember, good software, they're not supposed to get in, but somehow they do. Problem here? And then you think about this for another minute. It's, you know, let's say I'm a, I'm a chemical producer, right? And the whole notion of information sharing is I get together with other my, my other chemical producer friends, and I say, have the hackers been at you lately? Yes, no, maybe so. They try to do this. I've had problems with that. And then you go off and have coffee or tea or whatever, whatever it is you drink. That's not the information sharing I'm interested in. I want somebody to go to the guy who's got the software with the vulnerability to let the bad guy in, or who let the bad, you know, who let their other vulnerabilities having to do with the spreading through the network, and I want to say, You've got a vulnerability here. I want you guys to work on a fix. And having put, worked on a fix, I want you guys to proliferate the fix, and I want the problem fixed. As a chemical manufacturer, exactly how that problem is fixed is kind of really secondary for me. But all of a sudden, if you're taking a look at that model, you're taking a look at a different notion of information sharing. And then you're asking the question, not to how do peers put information together, but what is the mechanism by which we inform the identification of vulnerabilities so that we can get a fix on their vulnerabilities? Much, much different problem. But it doesn't really fit into the terrorist mold because that's not how you think about terrorism. Which is kind, of, kind of comes to the same thing that I want to kind of reiterate. It's different. This is not a form of warfare, a form of crime, a form of intelligence collection, although it actually comes closest there, a form of terrorism that just happens to take place in another domain. It's got its own rules here. Okay. Now, another thing that I think about when I think about cyber terrorism is the, I don't know if you've heard of this, the cyber 9-11, the bad guys coming into our system and wreaking all sorts of mischief. And the more I thought about it, I, I, I say, well, I don't know how likely 9-11 is. Maybe more likely, maybe less likely. On September 10th, 2001, not many people predicted the 9-11 that was going to take place, even though it turns out there was a precedent. But now let's look at 9-11 for a minute. 9-11 killed about 3,000 folks, did about 100 million bucks worth of damage. And then the United States government reacted to 9-11. And we established DHS and a lot of other security controls. And we went to two wars. 
as a result of which 6,000 Americans died, 10 to 20,000 were severely wounded, and we paid about a trillion dollars in war and about another half a trillion dollars in other associated expenses. So you think a minute for a minute and said, you know, 9-12 was a lot more expensive and dangerous than 9-11 was. So it got me to thinking about the question, what would a 9-12 look like in cyberspace? And the answer wasn't a particularly good one. This is why I, I love to come outside of Washington because they get a little crazy inside the Beltway here. Okay? One of the things we're going to want to do is retaliate against the guy who did it. And in fact, the more the damage, the faster is going to be the retaliation. Well, anybody who's worked in cyber forensics can tell you, it's not one of the things that's instant. Okay? Sometimes it takes a lot of work. If the guy doesn't really want retaliation, there are interesting ways of making it look like somebody else. But if you've got political pressure to retaliate, you may say, you know, I'd love to have the complete picture, but I've got to go. Why now? Who cares? I've got to go on what I got. Right? And so you end up retaliating without necessarily knowing why the attack took place and without 100% confidence that you know who carried out the attack. And if you've ever played strategy games, you know that the wor worst thing than having one enemy is having two enemies. By, basically, by retaliating against somebody who didn't do it, you may end up with two enemies. Something else to worry about is a trade war. People talk about cyber attack as if it's one level below kinetic conflict. But in fact, when you think about all our trade relationships with the world, you realize that, that the, the odds of a trade conflict are in fact much greater as a result of a cyber war and as a result of getting excited about a cyber war. Oh, we can't let any of these products because we don't trust them. Well, then we can't let any of these products from you because we don't trust these, right? Uh, you may have read about a month or so ago, there was a congressional report on Huawei and how we couldn't trust the stuff that's coming in from Huawei, right? Only if you looked at the report, all you could tell was that Huawei wasn't enthusiastic about answering congressional inquiries. Oh. Okay, but the good stuff was supposed to be in the classified appendix, which I haven't seen, by the way. But Reuters did, and they told us there's no good stuff over there either. But somehow we don't trust them. Well, so there's a Chinese province who declared that they're not going to buy Cisco either. These sorts of things can get out of hand. Okay, let's talk about some other reactions. How many of you are familiar with the term of active defense? That's one of those euphemisms for, we're going to get you before you get us, right? There's uh, some very bright people who sit at Fort Meade who love this active defense stuff. And you kind of have to worry if, in fact, their active defense is going to do what they think they do. Uh, remember, there was Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, and I don't have to say very much more to know that even the best of intelligence can sometimes get things wrong. Okay. Another thing that there's going to be a lot of pressure to after it's Cyber 9-11 is a national firewall across the United States. Now, a national firewall would be an enormous undertaking, which some people, by the way, are glad to take taxpayer money to do. But that essentially means that some computer is going to read e every email that you write that happens to go outside the country. Now, it turns out that probably more emails than, than one would think go outside the country because of all sorts of routing issues. Um, but that's neither here nor there. That's a lot of emails to be read. Okay? Well, if we're going to have uh, a national firewall, then the one thing we can't afford to have is encryption, right? Because encryption defeats a firewall because you can't read the stuff that's going through it, which means you can't have open wire, and you need hard authentication because we have to know where everything is coming from, which means we all need good cyber IDs, which means we can't have open Wi-Fi, which means we can't have Tor. You're all familiar with what Tor is, right? It's a good, good crowd, right? And it means you can't have uh, things like PGP. Well, that's a lot to pay for not having a cyber attack if you thought a national firewall would work, which, by the way, it may not for whole lots of other reasons. And then there's this whole notion of, well, it could have, attack could have come from a bad website. So we want the ability to take a look at everything that's on a website even before it's posted. And I probably don't even have a good enough imagination to imagine all the things that people who don't understand the Internet are going to want to put on the Internet. So, that's why I worry about a cyber 9-11. Not for what it will do, but for how it will motivate the people who are going to react to it to do things as a result of a 9-11. Okay, let me switch a little bit from the subject of cyber war 
and get into sort of the nuclear strategy for a little bit because it, it, it illustrates a question about whether the existence of cyber war, the existence of cybersecurity, is going to be uh, a destabilizing factor. And I do this, by the way, I worked at RAND that made its reputation on this whole nuclear business. In fact, have you, ever, have you any of you ever been in Santa Monica City Hall? There's this really nice sculpture here called Chain Reaction. Now, there's a town that does not like its leading employer <laughs> quite so much. At any rate, one of the things that people worried about is somebody was asked to do a study on where should a bomber bases be in Europe. Uh, it turns out that it's probably, the, in many ways, the most famous study that Rand had ever done. And it was based on the principle that if you're within range, if the enemy's within range, chances are so are you. So if you put your planes too close to the Soviet Union, there's a possibility the Soviet Union could wipe out your entire nuclear force, in which case all that deterrence you thought you had would come to nothing. So the whole notion of a second strike and instability, that the guy who goes first to the nuclear weapon has his existential edge over the other guy. And the nuclear community has been spending you know, decades and decades working on the problem. And if you guys are interested in nuclear strategy, I can answer more questions about that. But let me say a lot of people are worried about that in cyberspace as well. They're worried that because offense is dominant over defense, that in fact the first strike could be disabling. And if a first strike is disabling, then you've got the incentives to go first. And in a world in which you have the incentives to go first, to go on the offense, is a world in which you have a great deal of instability. Well, let's step back for a minute. How unstable is all this cyber war going to be? Well, first thing I have to mention is we still have nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons can still trump cyber weapons. In fact, if I had to make a chart, I started to make a seriousness chart like this. Uh, nuclear war here, a uh, large conventional war here, hurricanes. Uh, we had a little something called Sandy a few weeks ago, nice and breezy over in Washington. Fortunately, not much damage. And then finally, you have a cyber attack, which may or may not come close to Sandy. So th those nuclear weapons are still useful to have in your pocket if you're worried about anything else. Now, well, what about a cyber attack on a nuclear infrastructure? I can't rule it out. How many of you seen, have seen the movie War Games? Right, that was based on the presumption that there's a, a, a modem bank on the side of the command and control computers for Stratcom. I kind of rather doubt it. And in fact, the folks who run Stratcom, actually the folks who run our ICBM force, have gone publicly in saying it can happen. Um, are they right? I think they actually are. At least I'd like to think that they're right. And part of the reason they might be right is because this is one of those things where you don't really want to get all happy about networking. Yes, it is true. If I cannot dial in a nuclear attack from home, I actually have to get dressed to come to the office to start a nuclear war. But I consider this a very small inconvenience given everything that's at stake, right? And as it turns out, if you actually look at nuclear, the arsenal, it's fairly primitive. And it's primitive, they have managed to redo, um, they have managed to ignore the siren, siren call of networking for a lot of this stuff. And that's a good thing. And by the way, it's also a good thing if the other side also ignores the siren call of networking. Because we really don't want anything funny to happen to their nuclear weapons, because those are the ones that are actually pointed at us. So as a level of some, hoard of so some sort of assurance, OK? Now, the other thing you have to understand about cyber war is this is one of those forms of warfare where you can't really disarm the other side by a cyber attack. Not very well, at least. Consider what are the four and a half key components of a cyber war. The hacker, the information that a hacker knows or has access to, a computer, a network connection, right? Of those four, yeah, you can knock somebody off the network, but I mean, you're not going to knock them off every single network in the world because there's billions of connections. And yes, there are ways in theory that you can screw up with this computer, but what do computers cost now? What, $299.99 at Best Buy? Not exactly very hard to replace. So the whole notion that you can cripple a country's cyber attack capability with your own cyber attack capability, that doesn't really hold a great deal of water. Which means, by the way, that there are a lot of things you don't necessarily have to worry about in cyberspace. You hear a lot of talk in Washington about a cyber arms race, right? Um, 
But there's a big difference in nuclear war. In nuclear war, nobody thought that defenses were going to work at the time. In fact, we still don't have reasonably good defenses. The kind of 50-50-ish is the stuff I've read. Um, so that means it's like I got 1,000 nukes, the Soviets have 1,000, oh, maybe they have 2,000 nukes, so I got to get my 2,000 nukes, and, and it would go on and on and on like that, right? But in cyber war, it's not offense versus offense. It's offense versus defense. And in fact, you really don't know what kind of offensive capabilities the other guy has if he's got any good trade craft at all. So you don't really have the basis for an arms race. Um, people in the nuclear business talk about the, the cycle between alert and warning. That if you, raise, if you react in ways that anticipate a nuclear attack, the other guy's going to think that you're preparing for a nuclear attack, you're not just anticipating a nuclear attack, and he's going to raise his alert level on his offensive forces, which means you raise your alert level, and before you know it, everybody's on a hair trigger alert. alert. And people worried about that sort of stuff. But now, here's my question. I'm contra uh, anybody here from Uruguay or Paraguay? I usually like to pick on those because I can find nobody in my audience from that, okay? <laughs> you're in Uruguay and you're worried about a cyber attack from Paraguay, right? And you notice Paraguay cyber defenses are getting better. What do you conclude from this? Well, yes, Paraguay could be starting a, an unanswerable first strike on Uruguay. Or they finally got money in the cybersecurity budget for Paraguay. Or they fired their chief information systems officer and hired a new one. Or there's new opportunities here. Or a product came in. Or a really clever salesman walked out the door. When you look at all the reasons that people acquire cyber defenses, whoops, I've got to stay past this line. When you look at all the reasons that people acquire cyber defenses, the fact that they're going to war isn't prominent among them. Okay, so a cold look at what you can and cannot do with cyber war suggests it's not all that unstable an environment. However, Crises are not caused by what is true. Crises are caused by what is perceived to be true. And in cyberspace and in cyber war, the difference between perception and reality is very big. You have a nuclear explosion, you have what's called the blinding flash of the obvious. Not going to be any mistake on what happened. In cyberspace, you're going to have a great deal of doubt and ambiguity. Um, People might object because the level of cyber espionage that you're, that you're doing, which was acceptable at one day, is no longer acceptable on another day. Um, they may misinterpret defenses even though they shouldn't. Okay? They may have too much conf confidence in attribution. In other words, oh yeah, I think somebody did it, and they go ahead and strike back when it turns out they really don't have much more of an, than an educated guess. On the other hand, you could have instability if people have too little confidence in your attribution and they think they can strike with impunity, and so on and so forth. Okay? The important point to remember here is that the distinction between what is and what is perceived to be is particularly wide in this field. Particularly when you think about how much ignorance there is in this topic, it's almost kind of scary. Because there are a lot of bright people who know a lot of secrets in Washington who not only don't reveal the secrets very much, but are talking to an audience that wouldn't understand them even if they do reveal to them. Now, the late Ted, Ted, Ted Stevens referred to the uh, internet as what, a pile of tubes? I don't think he's all that atypical in terms of understanding of cyberspace. And when it comes to cyber conflict, there's uh, even more to be um, misinterpreting about. Let me switch a little bit um, into qu questions of crisis and crisis escalation. Okay? This is the thing that nuclear theorists talked about all the time. Herman Kahn, for instance, wrote a book. Actually, it was the first book I ever bought, maybe about a half a century ago, on escalation in nuclear conflict. Okay? But when you think about escalation in a cyber context, and how do we keep a cyber conflict contained, it turns out it's very, very difficult for everybody to agree on all the same red lines, or in this case, orange lines and blue lines. Right? Let me give you a scenario. Let's say we have a cyber conflict with another large country. Not to name any names, right? And we're interested in crippling their ability to conduct naval operations. So we hack into their afloat naval supply facility. We just want to mess up your logistics a little bit. You know, I mean, we're already shooting at each other, so I guess it's no big deal. And they say, well, we want to do the same thing. As far as we're concerned, attacks on military support, well, you've introduced that into play. So that's fair game. 
So they attack Guam. You know, they, they attack Guam's port, which is in Asia, right? And they say, hold it. That's an escalation. Because you've gone from attacks in the field to attacks on the homeland. And so we're going to look at a target support. A tar uh, we're going to attack a, a port in your home country. And, and the other guy says, wow, you've just switched on attacks on military support to attacks on civilian infrastructure. So we're going to attack your coal-fired power plant. And we say, hold it. You've just escalated from attacks on the homeland to attacks on industrial safety. Well, you folks can, are literate, and you can sort, sort of basically read the chart up here. What's the problem here? The problem here is that not one person in this confrontation thought they crossed the red line. Because to them, they didn't. But according to the other person, they did. So while each person was reacting in what they thought was underneath the red lines, it turns out they escalate all the way up to the top. It turns out that's a tricky little thing in cyberspace, because that requires um, a lot of nuance in terms of where you think the red lines are and where the other guy thinks that the red lines are. And, you know, next month I'm going to be sitting down with my counterparts from the People's Republic of China in what are called Track 1.5 negotiations. I can assure you, we're not even close to being able to negotiate about that. We're not even close to being able to basically discuss what is information warfare. Because we have one definition, which is closer to you mucked with my machines, and they have another definition, which is you put subversive material into my country via, oh, this is Google, YouTube, right? Well, between the two perspectives, it's really hard to get to first base. And this is like fifth base or sixth base in terms of nuances. So I don't have a great deal of confidence here in what they call escalation control and management. OK, tit for tat. That's another interesting notion in cyberspace, right? You did this, I didn't like this, I'm going to do that to you. And then you're going to learn that the impact of your carrying out an attack is, in fact, that you get an attack back. Tit for tat, right? Now, tit for tat works badly or well enough when you know what happened. But I would argue that within cyberspace, there's a disjunction between four things, among four things. What I hope to do by attacking your system what I think I've done by attacking your system, what you think you've do I've done by attacking your system, and then finally, what I really did by attacking your system. Now, some of this I can understand. You know, it's a military problem of battle damage assessment, right? But it would seem obvious that at least the perceived effects of the attack are the same as the actual effects of the attack, right? I mean, the guy that's got the stuff that's been broken knows it's been broken. Well, not necessarily so. You remember the Stuxnet attack? That attack was carried out essentially from what I believe and read in the papers and other things in late 2009. The Iranians did not realize they had a malware problem until 2010. And my hunch, June 2010, and my hunch is they didn't know that they had a problem at Natanz until they read about it in the New York Times, which would have been late September 2010, right? So these guys had gotten an attack, but because it was a corruption attack and not a disruption attack, they didn't, have, they didn't have the insight as to what was going on in their own system. Um, and it was only because the attack spread to someplace well outside the, the reactor that, in fact, the chain of clues was discovered. So here's a tit for tat, right? You start off with the intended effects of the attack. That is, what's in the head of the guy who's doing the attack? The guy you want to try to influence with the tit-for-tat policy. And then you get to the actual effects of the attack, which may be different, right? And then you get to the perceived effects of the attack, which may be different yet. And then I say, well, what's appropriate in terms of what I want to create as an effect going back? Which may be a miscalculation, because you're going to say, well, what are the, what, what are the nature of equivalences? Particularly if I want to strike back in a proportional manner. And then I have the same error and misperception and miscalculation going around the other way. So that by the time the guy who's decided to carry out an attack has in turn been affected by the attack, you've got six forms of error going around. And you ha end up having a pot potentially a very, very imprecise mechanism. Well, a lot of other topics I could cover, but I'm kind of running out of bandwidth here, or at least energy, or at least oxygen. <laughs> Um, 
But the, the bottom line I so, sort of want to come to is the same. I think Washington is an error when they think of cyber insecurity and conflict in cyberspace as just one more thing that they're familiar with. That they just take out the word physical and kinetic and put in the word virtual and cyber and they understand what they're talking about. And I want to basically say is you have to understand this on first principles. And then when you understand on first principles, you can walk through a lot of the strategic and the policy issues, but you do so having a firm grasp of what's actually going on in the machine and not what it looks like it's going on in the machine. So that, that concludes, and I'll take any questions, unless I've reduced you all to stun silence. <laughs> oh, well, I guess I'll start with one on sort of uh -huh. on the policy side. Because uh -huh. you were talking about this information sharing mm -hmm. with uh, people. And so recently, there's been mm -hmm. this move to get some legislation to make that mm -hmm. easier. Do you have some take on that? Do you think it's a good idea? Is that misguided? Well, what is the expression from Douglas Adams' books, mostly harmless? Uh, information is good stuff, OK? Um, there are some issues having to do with how you write the legislation in such a way that you don't violate privacy. privacy. Uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology and a few other groups in Washington, I think have been working the issue. I think, and I'm not that up on the current debate, that they're satisfied that the legislation has been written carefully. Part of the problem in writing legislation is the tendency to tack on notwithstanding any other law, dot, 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 which means they just run roughshod over everything that's ever happened before. People get nervous about this. I think it's sort of been worked out. But the question is not whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. The question is, is it going to do enough good to be even worthwhile bringing up in front of Congress? And as you can probably tell, I am not optimistic about how good information sharing is. Oh, that doesn't mean I'm against it. You can be for things that just don't do very much good, as long as they don't do, if they, as long as they do even less harm. I just uh, have a follow-up to that. Sure. Is information sharing about exploits. Uh huh. So, for instance, like um, if someone is using an exploit against us, right? Do we necessarily want to share it because we can catalog that and use it against? You know, it's also a valuable mm -hmm. weapon. Or, or ah, now you have touched a very interesting nerve. OK? I was actually talking about this to one of my colleagues who used to work at the Puzzle Palace out in Maryland. If I had to make a, a, plea, a plea for what the money should be used for, I would say it would be well spent, and I think I've actually said that in the talk, looking for vulnerabilities. Now, there are many ways you can look for vulnerabilities. You can hire people to do that. You, you can do all sorts of things. But the current way is we pay somebody to look for it. We create a market in vulnerabilities. Bug in fact, Google does that. Bug bounties? What? Bug bounties? Bug bounties, that's right. right. But you know, how, we spend $60 billion a year on cybersecurity. How much do we spend on bug bounties? How many orders of magnitude less? I think maybe four or five. I've got, I got to count the zeros. You can see what I mean by that. There's a lot more money that could be spent profitably. It turns out that there is a bug, a malware market. And it's, from what I understand, it goes from the bug hunter to somebody in the defense world to, need I say more? So if you've got one party that says, I want vulnerabilities so I can exploit them, and you've got another party that says, I want vulnerabilities so I can fix them, what do you get when they're both in the market? A bidding war. Now, if it turns out that the US taxpayer is financing both ends of the bidding war, then we have what we call implementation issues. <laughs> On the other hand, you want these guys at the fort to do their job. And you do want these guys at you know, DHS, if they were the ones running it, to do their job. It's just kind of unfortunate that they don't necessarily see eye to eye because they're not supposed to. Uh, uh. So you were when you were talking about the mm. uh, computers that you can install software on. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering if some of the things with mm. these netbooks and the cloud computing where the uh -huh. software is basically not on your machine, but mm -hmm. in some presumably, one would hope, trusted location, if uh -huh. that is a step in the direction of what you were thinking about. Well, I mean, General Alexander wants, he wants to get the federal government to the cloud. But what he really wants is a much thinner client. You know, I do remember the days of the terminals with the acoustic couplers. 
that may not be exactly where we want to go, but something like that may be the trade-off. You know, like a lot of things, what the trade-off you make depends on what you have at stake. If you, there are the trade-offs you want to make for, you know, Ma and Pa sitting in Vacaville, California, who don't really care if they have a virus on it because all you're going to have, the worst thing you're going to have is, you know, a DDoS attack because they're a part of a botnet and maybe that's not a major problem. On the other hand, if I'm running a nuclear power plant, I want to make another trade-off entirely. Sometimes we tend to forget in Washington that different folks have different requirements. And that you protect some, some information that's particular, you know. I'll give you an example. There's been a, a report recently that uh, AT, the advanced persistent threat's been all over Coca-Cola, right? I'm willing to bet you they didn't get Coke's secret formula. Because <coughs> I'm willing to bet you they didn't put it on their internet. I'd like to think so, guys, that they keep it in a safe somewhere in Atlanta, right? Because they've segregated information that they need to protect from the information they need to circulate. Well, as it turns out, the information they need to circulate was also about their purchase of an overseas company. Was that a good idea? Was that a useful trade-off? You know, would they have been better off? I can't make that decision. But that's a decision that people have to make. What do you protect? What do you not protect? Or to give you a bumper sticker, Insecurity is the price we pay for convenience. Inconvenience is the price we pay for security. Okay, I can say you've been a kind audience. <laughs>